Welcome to FOB TV, the future of business. I'm your host, Kevin Benedict, and I want to welcome each of you here today. This is the third part in a series that we've done, which I'm very excited about. This series had four panelists, and these four panelists represent three different universities in the giant educational publishing company, Wiley. There's Oxford University, Cornell Tech, and the University of Toronto all represented. We have these experts, our panelists today, share their expertise, their insights, forecasts, and projections for how the pandemic is going to change this world. Not only the pandemic, but digital transformation in general and some of the pre-existing trends out there that were already happening within higher education. So again, welcome to this. This particular episode, we're welcoming Greg Morissette. He's the Dean and Vice Provost at Cornell Tech. He has brilliant insights today. And if you want to watch the entire virtual event that these people participated in, the link will be at the bottom there in the comment section here on YouTube. But for now, thanks for joining us, and here's Greg. I want to welcome everyone to the panel discussion, our fireside chat, if you would, where we're going to talk about the University of Tomorrow and the role of technology. Greg, let's start with you. Now, we know that digital transformation, I mean, universities have been going through digital transformation for some time. They've been on that journey, but the pandemic has really changed things. How have you seen it change? And do you think the whole trajectory or time frame of digital transformation has been impacted by the pandemic? First of all, thanks so much for having me uh, on the panel. I really appreciate it. A uh, great set of questions that, as you said, the pandemic really brought this to the fore. I mean, transformation has been happening for a long time, but the pandemic really accelerated things. And part of it was faculty were just resistant to leveraging new technologies, uh, asynchronous delivery of content and a bunch of other approaches, they just were stuck in their ways. And so it sort of you know, gave them the excuse, the kick in the pants that they needed to actually try these ideas. And I think we're seeing a, a, a huge explosion, a sort of a pre-Cambrian event of lots of great ideas emerging from classrooms all over the world. Um, you know, here at Cornell Tech, we had to pivot within a couple of days uh, when the pandemic hit New York City uh, to online. And we, we didn't have a lot of time to really prepare for it, but we had a tech savvy faculty. And so they didn't really have any trouble with the technology. But we had to really spend the whole summer rethinking how we teach, what we're teaching, the way we're delivering it, and the right modes uh, to address students that were scattered around the world now, uh, from Beijing to Johannesburg to uh, uh, Cartagena. And so that kind of uh, challenge, bridging time zones, uh, finding mixed modalities, engaging students in a productive way online has been a challenge that I think our faculty have, have risen to. Greg, I've had the opportunity and privilege of talking to a bunch of different representatives from different schools, both on the business side of the school and the teaching side. And one of I was struck by one point in particular. Everyone tells me, you know what, parents and students highly value the university experience. And, um, and this is one of the things that they're most pained to be missing when classes go online. How, you know, as more and more of our classes are forced to move online, either because of competition and economics or whatever reason, how do we continue to maintain a university experience in that kind of environment? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I think, you know, when you talk about a university experience, it's a bundling of a lot of different things. Uh, people think primarily of the lectures and the classroom experience, but the things that our students really valued in coming here this year when most of our courses are online and they really, as you said, they really do value being together in person. It was the teamwork that they, that they experienced both for team oriented courses, but also outside the classroom, studying together, working together, socializing together, networking. Those are the things that the students really value. So part of what we're going to have to do is rethink, uh, why we're bringing them here and what are the advantages in putting them together face to face and how do we take advantage of online resources? I think, um, for example, we have a big studio uh, course that traditionally is, is a big 
uh, in-person experience. This year, we flipped it, of course, out of necessity, but actually the results are better. And, and there's a lot of good evidence that uh, that kind of active engagement where you're using online materials in a good way, but using the in-person time in a more productive way to give more personalized feedback leads to better outcomes. It's not clear that this will help us scale better or, or you know, because it's actually harder uh, to do a good job of this sort of mix of online and in-person instruction. It's still very labor intensive, very demanding. And to stay fresh, you have to keep those, uh, those materials up to date. So I think it remains to be seen whether we're going to see cost savings per se, but it definitely leads to better educational outcomes. Greg, so in this new world that we all live in, what does the university campus, what happens to the university campus and what does that look like in the future? Yeah, it's a great question. As we're thinking about filling out phase two of Cornell Tech here on Roosevelt Island, we're we're thinking about the buildings that we want to construct and what are the classrooms and the workspaces and the libraries of the future going to be. And I think the days of big auditoriums are, are probably past us, that big classes, those are exactly the ones where you can't engage personally with students and are probably better done in an online asynchronous fashion. But I think uh, finding new kinds of study spaces where students can work together in small teams uh, and can bring in their partners from abroad, uh, you know, through the appropriate video technology will be something that we're going to have to think about. And we'll have to have flexible, small, reconfigurable classrooms scattered around the campus to support that and the kind of study spaces that students need. So for those of us who have an opportunity to build new buildings, uh, I think we're going to see a lot of difference from the classic university architecture and, and how we conceptualize and think about the campus. So, Greg, in this new world that we're all kind of being forced into and uh, moving through, are universities going to be forced to look at kind of different ways of operating the university, different business models? Will their purpose change? So, you know, how will all these different um, uh, outside influences impact that? Yeah, well, I think it's different for every school. I mean, especially in America, there's so many different kinds of schools from community colleges, you know, up to tier one or research universities. And so I think different schools at different at different parts of that ecosystem will be affected differently. I do think um, we have to rethink the business models. At the end of the day, the cost of education for uh, middle class families in the U.S. has just skyrocketed. I think uh, online degrees will will start to flourish and take off, but um, that'll primarily impact things like community colleges, state colleges, where uh, people are really looking for that cost-effective savings and not necessarily the full university residential experience that we may have in the back of our minds when we're thinking about education. Um, here at Cornell Tech, we're thinking hard about how do we take ideas around technology to a much broader range of students, uh, you know, ar ar around New York. So we're partnering with K-12 as well as uh, organizations like CUNY, the, the City University of New York, and it's 12 or 12 of its campuses to see uh, can we build partnerships and relationships that reach a, a broader audience with the materials that we're developing here at Cornell Tech in partnership with other institutions. So yes, we're going to be rethinking it, but I don't know that there's one size fits all for, for all universities. I think it's going to be different for, for different ones. So Greg, when we look ahead at this university of tomorrow, what are the technology gaps between where universities are today and where they're going to need to be, let's say five years out? Yeah, great question. I mean, uh, you know, with it's clear we got the networking down well enough to support Zoom and, and, and video conferencing, which has been a great leap forward. I mean, you know, if you just think back 10 years ago, if we'd had a pandemic, we wouldn't have been able to do exactly this kind of meeting that we're having now worldwide. But it's still so far off from that uh, really engaging experience. For example, um, you know, w one thing that still doesn't work well is a mixed mode thing where you have some students in person and some students remote. Um, you know, you inevitably end up forgetting the remote ones or whatever. It's just not immersive enough. They're not, they're not there present uh, in the sort of virtual space that, that you want. Uh, so that's one challenge. I think another one is um, we all miss the, the personal interactions. You know, when you're filing into the classroom together and, and you're talking or after the class, you come up to the professor to ask them a question because you didn't understand something. And we're missing those lightweight 
light touch engagements. And so user interfaces and, and ways of rethinking a virtual classroom or conference or whatever are, are going to have to be developed, especially over the next five years, if we're going to have uh, meaningful, deep engagement around, uh, around remote telepresence in the classroom. We have some questions that have come in here. One of the questions, and Greg, let me direct this question to you, is where might competition in the future come from for universities? Is it, is it different kinds of universities? Is it something different than a university? Well, I mean, I think businesses uh, do a lot of in-house training now. And so uh, there may be competition for, I think, uh, vocational skill-based kinds of training coming from businesses themselves, especially ones of size. I mean, you look at a company like Microsoft, there's all kinds of certification training and other things in that context. Um, I'm not sure that we'll see competition beyond that sort of vocational skill-based thing from businesses. We'll see heated competition, though, around the world for uh, universities sort of being broken apart, if you will. I think I think you're going to see the rise of the rock star professor whose videos and classes and MOOCs and other things uh, really take over core courses and disciplines. Like we may see the person that teaches calculus well, uh, and that takes off. And we've already seen this with Andrew Ng, for example, at Stanford or David Malin at Harvard. Uh, people that really are great at teaching a particular class and and they'll standardize on it. But I think it's like a book. We'll use that as material as part of our classes and we'll remix it. We'll, we'll, we'll combine it with other materials and uh, hopefully we'll continue to have the rich uh, ecosystem, of, uh, diverse ecosystem that we have in the U.S. around education so that we don't get into a monoculture of, of thinking this is the, the only way that you can deliver this particular content. So I think that kind of uh, competition will change the way universities operate and the way they engage with their faculty and the way they think about uh, the educational materials that they're putting up online. One more question that has come in. In the retail industry, there's been a big focus over the last few years on personalizing a user experience. Do you anticipate more personalization for students' experiences at universities and maybe even their path and education? Yes, this is the thing that I'm most excited about. And I'm already seeing this at, at both uh, the graduate and the undergraduate level. So if you think about um, the undergraduate level, I think AP tests and AP courses are going to get wiped out by the availability of good university level online courses for high school students that are advanced enough to take a course. And then when they get to that university, uh, why should they reset? Why should they have to take uh, you know, courses? So uh, there's an opportunity or a need really for universities to adapt to that real world where, or new world where high school students are coming in already with some university level courses under their belt. And so we need to find custom pathways for them uh, moving forward. At the graduate level, I think it's already happening and it's really exciting. We're seeing a faculty member, for example, if we have a hole in the background of some student, maybe they need a technical subject, we can point them to an online course and say, go take that um, and, and fill that, that gap in. And, and we, can, we can do that customization, especially for PhD students. And, um, and you can go get the very best person in the world or the very best course in the world to deliver the content uh, uh, for that student. You still need uh, local help and local TAs and local direction and, um, and engagement. But uh, it, it is opening up that personalization, that opportunity to really strengthen uh, where the student where they need it, as opposed to just having a one-size-fits-all for masses of students. Thank you, Greg.